It's no secret that F sharp works quite a bit differently than C sharp or Visual Basic. It's a it's, it's multi paradigm, but let's face it, the the main paradigm of it is drastically different. CLS compliance does aid interop quite a bit. It as long as something is CLS compliant, it should work across any CLS compliant language. F sharp is, so anything that is CLS compliant from C sharp will be callable from F sharp. The experience is not good. Any of you who have had to work as an F sharp programmer with C sharp or Visual Basic libraries really knows exactly what I'm talking about. You might be able to do functional programming in your own code, but anytime you have to hook into the other stuff, it's a massive paradigm change. What I want to show off is one way to help with this. Whether you're a library developer looking to offer more natural feeling F sharp support, or you're somebody who just has to work with libraries that don't do this, and you're trying to make things a little bit better for yourself or your team. There is a way to overload functions in F Sharp. If you're an experienced F Sharp developer, you know that the normal way functions work is through being generic, as generic as possible. The type will resolve to whatever the most generic thing it can for whatever the expression that you've bound is. And if you try to tie in to C Sharp or Visual Basic code, this doesn't work that great. Let me show you what I mean. We're going to just have a contrived example of uh, write, and we're going to just say that it con uh, directly calls console write and puts the text there. As you can see, it's not happy about it. It's complaining about how it can't resolve what type is. And sure enough, it does have its a tick, which is your standard generic parameter type. But it, it, it just can't figure out what right to call. You can work around this for some stuff by saying obj instead, and that works in this instance, because console.write does support object parameters. It's a little less than ideal, of course, because some of those writes are actually optimized for specific types, which is why there's so many overloads of that, and you just won't be using them at all. That's not great. Now, this unfortunately is one of those rare cases where this technique doesn't work. I, I will say from my own experiences, I never encountered a situation where this approach doesn't work until trying to record this video. This is the second time now I'm recording it, because my original plan just didn't work. But I do have a another contrived example where this does work. It's not... what I'm doing directly here is not going to be practical, but it will show you how this approach works, and I will explain everything that's going on. So we're going to have a... just... just and we're going to give it uh, two generic parameters and I'm going to explicitly declare the types on these just so that you can see that there's definitely no trickery going on. That it is going to enforce these and if it cannot enforce these it is going to complain about it. It is going to throw an error that it cannot resolve. Um, and to show you kind of what I mean Let's just say uh, a plus three, and you can. Well, in this case, it's a warning, but either way, you know the 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 compiler will actually complain about this, that it's saying that because three is an int, 
it the entire thing has to resolve to ends. Um, that's not what we want. We want this to resolve I dynamically, or at least something that feels dynamically. So we're going to do different things based on what the type of A and B are. We're not going to deal with uh, the return type. That The approach for that dealing with that isn't any different. It's just not something I wanted to deal with. Um, so the first step here is to define an inline function. Uh, I've taken to always declaring these as private just because they're the syntax for calling it is not pleasant. Uh, this is essentially our syntactic sugar around this function that we're defining now. We need to give it uh, an a hat, a b hat, and a c hat parameter uh, just because we have the a, b, and c there. Oh, uh, I also need to give it a name that's kind of important. Again, this is just a convention that I've got taken to, much like declaring it private. Uh, I just keep the same name but with an underscore in front of it. Y you can do whatever you'd like. It really doesn't matter. That's just a convention that I've, I've taken to. Um, but we're keeping the parameters for here. Uh, if A and B are the same type, you can alleviate this by just doing this. And you, you should be able to figure the rest of this out as we go along, uh, but yeah. So what we then do is where, and we're going to give it an explicit condition on A, um, and I am, that's not where is it, it's when. And then we're going to say that well, what this is doing, what I'm setting up here, is saying we're going to look for something on whatever the a hat parameter is. Uh, so whatever this type resolves to, uh, we're going to look for this thing on that. And we're going to specifically look for a static member. And then we have to give it a name. And this name is important. This name is going to be explicitly the name of the thing we are looking for. So this has to be correct. Um, this matters. And then we are going to give it the signature of foo. Now, I'm just doing contrived stuff. Normally you would want to look up what the signature of the uh, member you're, you're calling. Um, this is typically going to be a method. So just find out what the method uh, signature is. Uh, in my instance, since I'm going to be defining that after the fact, uh, I already know what this, that signature is going to be. If you're having trouble figuring that out, pause now, define the methods, and then uh, just see what the signatures are and copy that signature into here. But since I already know, we're going to take an a, uh, an a hat and a b hat, and because these are on a method, these are going to be tupled. That's why I'm using the star here rather than the normal function passing. Now that we have that, I can close this generic off and uh, declare the parameters, which we're just... I keep to using the same parameters. It just helps with readability. And then we need to define the function. Um, well, assign the function, bind it. And we largely just copy this whole thing. Why are you complaining? Um, I'm not sure if there's an issue there. There is. Oh, yes, there is. This needs to be... There we go. Okay. Now we bind into here. So this whole thing largely gets copied. We're going to have the a hat and we're going to do the static member foo. Um, 
and now we pass in those parameters that we declared. So what is going on here, basically, is that we're saying that we're going to be working with these three generic parameters on whatever the a hat parameter is we are going to look for a static member that is explicitly called foo and has this type signature we are then going to call that static member foo with that type signature that was found on the a hat parameter with the tupled arguments a and b hopefully you follow i understand this whole thing is not normal code you write so then we're going to call this from here. Remember, this is basically the thing giving us syntactic sugar over this monstrosity. And since we're being explicit about, well, in most cases, you can just do the underbar thing of I don't care, figure it out, uh, and then just give it the parameters A and B. And you see, basically everything works out just fine, except since it's... it's At this point, it's doing what it's supposed to. We're not done yet, but I still want to explain the error here so that you can kind of get an idea of how this is working. Um, but we're not, we're not done yet. What's going on is that it's trying to resolve these parameters and can't. So what F# -sharp does is it defaults to obj. Now you can see here that the a tick parameter is what I just said, resolved to obj. And as I was explaining here, the first parameter, which is a tick in this instance, the which maps to the a hat. Within a hat, it's looking for the static member foo. And you can see that it's complaining about, well, actually it might be clipping uh, on uh, for you guys a little bit, but what it's saying is that it can't find a method foo on the type obj, which makes sense. That's not something obj has defined. Um, if the types you are working with have this defined for it, you should be good. Uh, you may need to explicitly declare what those types are in any of these. And again, I've set this up so that it maps exactly, but you can just be explicit about a type. Um, like we're going to say, look for foo within uh, int32. And of course it's not gonna find it, but you can see here that the error message changed a little bit, that it's saying that the type int32 does not support the member foo. Makes sense. It doesn't. We're going to change that back. And here's what you do now if you're trying to overload on something that is from a static class, or you're going to do the bizarre thing that I'm about to do, where you're going to define very random and unrelated stuff to do based on what the type is. You need to define an additional type. Now I have taken to calling this binder. That's just convention. You're not being explicit here. Just know that you need to copy this name into one of the new generic type parameters we're going to be adding, but you can call this whatever you want. This has to have the same visibility as this though. So if this is private, this has to be private. If this is public, this has to be public. They have to be the same. Uh, so then we're not going to do a default constructor. It's fine. We're basically treating this as a static class. We just can't define a static class. Then we're going to define the static member foo. And 
Rem remember, this is an explicit thing, so these names have to match exactly. It's not going to resolve them based on these the type signature. It is going to specifically look for the name and then the type signature. The name has to match. We're then going to give it the arguments and let's do, I don't know, integer. Uh, well, A, integer, and B, integer, and we're not going to say what to return because, quite frankly, the type system can figure the rest of that out. Um, you can treat this exactly as you would treat any F-sharp code normally. You know, you might need to define one or both of the type parameters, um, but I can probably leave these out for what I'm going to do. Uh, a times B uh, divided by 3. And yeah, it, it resolved those just because 3 is so explicit that the rest have to be the int32 type. But you'll notice this is still complaining. And the reason for that is nothing about this knows to look inside of this type. So what we have to do is add another generic parameter and what the community has taken to is to define at the start of this another generic parameter called t hat and the reason for that is it's not really a parameter of the function that we're defining it's just another where to look for it so we have t hat there and we need to add it as well to here And here and in in this part sometimes autocomplete tries to help you out and does the wrong thing so you may need to fight that a little bit but now what we're saying is that basically the same thing we have a static member foo with this signature but you can look for it on the t hat or the a hat parameters and now we're going to add a new one you cannot let it try to resolve that it just it doesn't make any progress but you can specifically add that type and it will resolve that now because there's only one foo defined it is giving a little warning about how it's less generic than we're declaring it as because we're declaring it as generic parameters and it only resolves to this specific one, which is of course defined for int. Uh, and that's the same thing. Because we didn't declare these explicitly, then they're considered generic. Yeah. Uh, we'll shut that one up by telling it that these are specifically ints. This one, it'll complain as long as there is only a single member defined here. And rightfully so, if you're doing all of this just for a single one, just put this code here. But what this boilerplate, I guess, this magic going on here allows us to do is define a new one. Uh, let's say that works for a car and a car. And we're going to do, I don't know. No, what are we going to do with the cars? Concatenate them, which in F-sharp is actually a bit of a pain. It's going to complain a little bit, right? Constraint to type obj and constraint to type obj. Uh, constraint to type obj. That might not be good. It might not work. Okay. Oh, um, if I remember right, this has to be inline. So if we change that... Okay, I forgot about that. That is important. Um, the inline nature of this is extremely important. Uh, F-sharp type resolution is sophisticated. That's 
sophistication is partially why we're able to abuse it the way that we are here. Um, but there are two general approaches it takes when resolving type parameters. The normal approach is to dynamically resolve them at runtime. That doesn't work with this trickery. You have to resolve them at compile time. And the only way to do that is to inline it. So when both of these are inlined, what it'll what winds up happening is anytime you call foo with these parameters, it looks for whatever member matches and just puts that member in its place. These calls, they disappear. And that's what allows this to work. So if we, uh, we're still gonna need to print. So we're just going to instead call uh, foo and I don't know, two and three. And I don't know if that's going to, because uh, you're not compatible with that. Uh, I'm not an extensive F-sharp programmer, so bear with me. I understand how this works, I understand a lot about the language, but I regularly forget syntax stuff. This, this isn't the environment I normally work in. Uh, so let's just call this, I don't know, A. Foo, two and three. And of course we get an int out here because it's just flat out placing that one in its place. And another one B is foo, and we need to give this one characters, so we're going to say, I don't know, A and one. And of course we get a string, because that's what the output of this one is. So now if we print, uh, da, 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 I don't know, can we just do this? Is this a thing? No, because it's... Um, I don't remember how to... Do this. And I think if we say digit, that's not... Remove that. Okay, that's... Yes, and then it's uh, S, I think, for strings, and we do that, and you all check out. Now, if I run this, we should get the output of each of these independently, even though we're calling the same function. And just because I'm determined to see if I understand F sharp correctly, can I do that? I can't. No, no, I can't. Ugh. If I wrap that. I can. Okay. I'm gonna do that. Now, we're gonna run this and we should get the output of each of these independently, even though this is technically the same function, just we're calling it with different types. And we do. I'm not checking the math on that, but that one's definitely correct. And regardless, it's clearly calling different uh, different operations. Now, you can implement something similar by using obj as your type parameter for everything, and then pattern matching on it and doing different things based on what the selected type is. Uh, this approach is faster for what is hopefully obvious. Uh, this is happening at compile time, and it's just placing the appropriate thing in based on the type parameter, uh, which means there's no runtime overhead with this approach. The other thing, though, is if your type parameter is obj, you never get an error message at compile time because everything is obj. Not so true with modern.net versions, because ref structs violate that, but basically everything is obj, and everything is a valid type. So let's pass in... 
oh, I don't, I don't need to do that. This isn't going to work anyway. So let's just do a foo on a string. Hello. And then again on an, uh, just a character for the exclamation point. And, oh, my error message is clipping. Um, it's clipping off the screen, which means you guys can't see that. So... I will take a screenshot of it and put it in post so that you guys can see this, but it's actually explicitly telling us that one of the type parameters, and it is clear which one, uh, cannot work because it's not compatible with, and it's naming the other two type parameters that it could be. Uh, string is obviously the one that's not working because this matches car, which of course matches this one. So string is not matching, and it's saying the two types for A that it could be. Now we can work around this and magically make it work if we step member foo A for string, B for car, and we take an A and concat on B. Get hash code. String. Because I'm doing bizarre contrived stuff and I just want to make this do something. Now, if we print fn, and I think the hash code of a character is just the number, uh, its code point, um, I'm pretty sure that's just the result of casting it to a integer. Uh, it's probably just that, but uh, this clearly resolves now, and if we run this again... Okay, that's not the code point. I, I, I know that's definitely not the code point of an exclamation point. So, interesting. But we're still resolving all of these correctly. Now just to try to add in some something to confuse this, to show you that it doesn't get confused, we're going to add another one uh, that takes a int32, I don't need to capitalize that, int32 and takes a car, so we're intermixing these types, and we're going to do, uh, I don't know, a, well, I'm going to convert that to a string. Uh, so we're going to do a times 4 plus 7 uh, to string, and we're going to concat uh, b. All of these still check out, it's not complaining still. And we're going to add another one of these, and this is a string as well, so we'll just do that. Uh, foo, and what did I say, an integer and then a car? Yes. So, I don't know, let's give it 42 and t. And that one checks out. So now if we run this again... You are going, right? Okay, that was weird. But either way, you see that everything is still working. It It's weird boilerplate, and I'm actually rather amazed this works, even though I understand why this works. It's still amazing to me that this works at all. It's definitely abusing F-sharp's type resolution algorithms. Um, but yeah, there's no performance overhead to this, and you get overloading. You can use this, and I primarily use this, for creating very F natural F-sharp feeling um, bindings to code that was written in C-sharp or Visual Basic. You can take all the overloads that you wrote and 
still make them work and still get great error messages. And yeah, it, it's a bizarre system. I highly doubt this is something you would stumble upon accidentally trying to get this to work, but it works and it, it works well. Um, that's it for this one. I do have some more tricks dealing with abusing F-Sharp's type system. and uh, The one I'm going to cover next definitely builds on top of this, so hopefully you understand what's going on. If not, leave a message down in the comments and I'll try to uh, explain it to you. Um, the next one is on overloading operators. It's not done... It, it's, it's mostly done the same way, but it, it's... I'll cover that in the next video. Until then, have a good one.